<laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna look at just a couple of thoughts out of uh, one Kings chapter seventeen, if that's okay. So, um, if you got your Bible, open it again to one Kings chapter seventeen, or I can't remember the page number now. Was it three five eight? Three five eight, um, and we will no doubt reference a couple of bits and pieces. Isn't it interesting? <sighs> We're, all, we're in a pretty desperate time, aren't we, at the moment? Um, even those, those prayers were superb, by the way. The way they were articulated was absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much um, for, for those. But uh, you kind of listen to a lot of that, don't you? And you think, what, what is going on um, in our world at the moment? It can feel a bit like desperate times. You know, with cost of living crises, different world wars taking place, uh, famines um, that are not even being reported in the media, um, there's all sorts of things going on. You could say, okay, we're in a pretty desperate time, um, both here in the UK, but also around the world. Can, you, can anyone remember that there's an old phrase, um, desperate times call for what? Desperate measures. Desperate measures. Yeah, we all know that phrase. But when I was thinking about that phrase, I was thinking, hmm, I, I, I agree with that phrase on one hand, but I don't think God gets desperate. You know, I don't think God is caught off by surprise with anything that's taking place. If we, if we believe that God is the Alpha and the Omega, that he's the all-knowing, I don't think God gets desperate, but I do think God chooses to do things differently when we're in desperate times. And that's what I want to have a look at this morning, just to encourage us, but also challenge us that when there are desperate times, I think there are different measures. There are different things that God wants to do when desperate times are, are among us. And like I say, I think there are desperate times going on at the moment, and I think God wants to do something different. And we're going to explore, well, what does that look like? How does God do things differently? You know, what, what can we learn from the scriptures? What can we learn from this passage in 1 Kings chapter 17 about how God does things differently. Is that okay? You know, when I think about, as anyone here a parent? Okay, we've got a number of parents. Remember when your kids were young and there were desperate times when your kids didn't eat? You know, when you're like, you got your food out, the meal's there, and you're trying to make your child eat. How many times did we do something a bit different and a bit crazy at times? You know, you did the, uh, the plane. You know, the helicopter, come on, you can eat this, you can eat this. We used to do a funny little dance, like, if you eat a chip, if you eat a chip, if you eat a chip, you can do the sausage jump, you know, and things like that. And, you know, you make up these crazy things. And, you know, I remember a time when Eli was young, and um, I think it must have been only about five or something, and we were away camping, and Noah came running back across the field, going, Dad, 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 quick, quick, Eli's stuck up a tree. It's like, what? And then you kind of like, how am I going to get a des desperate times call for different measures? You know, and, and I, I want to explore that this morning. How does God do things differently when things are in a desperate place? Because there is this verse. Uh, do I need a clicker? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, there we go. Um, there's a verse which says this in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. And I love this verse. I'm so, um, it fills me with hope. It fills me with hope when I think about the things that are going on in our world. It says this, See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the, in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Uh, you should be filled with hope when we read a verse like that or a passage like that. You know, when we think about the wilderness, that place which feels as if we constantly are going round and round and it's, there's never a way to break out of it. When we think about the wasteland, those things that are desolate, those things that are broken, maybe there's broken relationships, maybe there's illness, maybe there's a child that's wandered away from God. You know, all of those things that maybe we would go, we're desperate, we're desperate, God, for you to do something different. And then you read a verse like this, see, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? See, I think in desperate times, God wants to do things differently. He wants to fill us with hope. He wants to bring a new thing into our world. And so how does God do that? What does that look like? Why, Luke, did we read 1 Kings chapter 17? I mean, how does that relate to all of this? I think there's three simple things that we can learn from this passage with Elijah and the widow about how in desperate times, 
God does things differently. The first thing is this, different provision. When you read this passage in 1 Kings chapter 17, this, this, it's almost as if 1 Kings chapter 17 is broke down into three different chapters. Um, and the first chapter we read was about Elijah being fed by the ravens. How there's a, there's a, fat, there's a drought that's coming through the land. So you'd say desperate times. Okay, desperate times, the drought. And, so, and then we read this amazing little passage at the beginning of 1 Kings chapter 17 where the Lord leads Elijah to the Kerith Ravine, and here we find that ravens brought Elijah food, and he drank from the brook. Raven. I don't know whether you've ever taken the time to go, ravens? Really? Ravens? How, how does, you know, and I think God was just wanting to show us that in desperate times, there's different provision. You know, ravens, if you're, if you're an ornithologist, anyone an ornithologist here? No, nope. okay, so you're not gonna uh, kill me if I'm wrong with all of this. But when I've read into it, it, ravens are aggressive omnivores. They are not the type, they scavenge on dead, on the dead. They're not the type of birds that you would go, oh, you, you know, you would have thought that God would use a dove. Yeah, yeah, you know, nice, gentle little bird bringing you a nice little bit of food. But no, he chose ravens. The ravens are actually classed as unclean animals. And so for a Jewish person to be brought food by ravens was totally not right. That was not the way that things should be done. But I think in desperate times, there's different provision. God chooses to provide in different ways. When we think about the desperate nature of children living in poverty, and that's what I'm here standing in the gap, advocating on the behalf of the children, is that at times there needs to be different provision brought in in order to be able to help a child break out of the desperate situation they're in. And could you be that provision today? But I think for you personally, it's to realize that when you're in desperate times, God wants to provide, but it might be different to what's been done before. There's times when I think about my own life where I've become fixated on the way God provides rather than the God who provides. Because of things that have been done in the past, we go, oh, that's how God does it. You know, you can think about Moses wandering through the wilderness and the time when he was crying out to God and going, God, I need to be able to provide water. And the first time God says, well, strike the rock. And he struck the rock and water came out. But then it's almost as if Moses became fixated on the way God provides, because the next time it happened, he struck the rock again, and God was like, no, 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 just speak to the rock. You know, you don't need to strike it this time. Sometimes, in desperate times, God chooses to do things differently and provide differently. So that's the first point, different provision. The second point is this. I think God does different partnerships. He puts different things in place. When you think about this passage here, desperate time, remember, there's a, there's a drought in the land. All of a sudden, he brings this partnership together between the prophet Elijah and a widow. A widow. Really, that's the partnership that you want to put together to see this incredible miracle take place? A completely different partnership than I, certainly I would have dreamt of. That wouldn't have been the partnership that I'd have chosen to put together in a desperate place. But God chooses to take, put a different partnership together and in place. You know, a widow who's going through trauma, who's going through a place of where she says, she literally says, I'm about to go and make one more meal and then this, my son and I are going to die. We're going to have our last meal and then we're going we're gonna to die. And yet God chooses to put together this partnership with a desperate woman who's in a place of trauma and says, no, 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 come on, let's see what God might be able to do with this. How many of us discount ourselves from God being able to do something in us and through us because of our past or our history, because at one point we went through this? How many of us think that God could never do anything with me or through me? I'm standing here this morning going, no, please don't think that. Because God wants to do, put different partnerships into place. Don't ever discount yourself from God being able to use you. 
God can do incredible things with the most broken of us. In fact, we're all broken. And yet God views us as something special and wants to invite us in. You know, I, th I think it's fascinating when you read this passage because, you know, the widow was um, using the language of your God at the start. And I'll come to a, a shift that takes place in the language later on. But I think the way that God wants to operate in, dif in desperate times is to invite you to experience God for yourself. And I think in this moment, he wanted, God was saying, no, I want to invite you, widow. I want to invite you into, for you to be able to experience for yourself what I can do and, the, and my power and what's all available to you. So never discount yourself because God is always saying, I want to put different partnerships into place. There's an amazing guy um, who's now a trustee for Compassion UK, a, a gentleman called Richard Weiss. He's a doctor, Dr. Richmond Wandera. He's originally from Uganda. He was, he was a child that, was, um, that lived in extreme poverty. You know, he tells a story of how at night, when it rained, that was the night, that was the night that they would stay standing at night because of all the water coming through the tin roof. And here's this, here's this man who every, the world would discount. The world would say there's never anything that could good that could come from this. And now he's running a pastor's discipleship network across Uganda. He's training 10 and a half thousand local uh, church leaders to be able to lead in African churches. He's now a trustee of Compassion UK. And God just said, no, no, come and partner with me and see what can take place. You might be in a desperate place, but I know that in desperate times, there are different partnerships and just see what I might be able to do. What might God be able to do in and through you if you embrace that new thing? The last thing is this, different plans, different plans. In desperate times, God seems to put together different plans and things that we wouldn't dream up. You know, when you read this passage, and, and this really challenged me, because who would have thought that the plan that God would want to put into motion in a desperate time would be for the woman's son to die? I would not be thinking that's a good plan. That would not be the plan that I would think to put in motion in order to bring someone to a place of faith. And the reason we know that there was a big shift in this is because the language the woman uses right at the end. At the beginning of the passage, she's saying, you're God. At the end of the passage, she's saying, I know that this is the truth, that the words that come from your mouth are truth. It would not have been the plan. I would not have thought, you know, you'd be going, God, seriously? That's the best you can come up with? That's the plan that you're going to put into motion in order to bring a family. And, and from that point, probably a whole generation, generational cycle to a place of faith. Really? That's the plan? But I think in desperate times, God does different plans. Think about your own life. Think about the ways in which God has turned up in your life when you've gone, oh, okay, that's different. That certainly wouldn't have been the plan that I would have thought of. How many times does God do that? Time and time again. When you think about, you know, there's so many passages, so many amazing stories, isn't there? But Gideon, um, uh, fighting against the Midianites, when he, he, he pulls together a big group of people and then God says, no, 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 take them, you know, those who are a bit afraid, send, send them home. Okay, drink from, drink from the lake. Okay, those who lack, send them home. Those who bring the water to the mouth, yeah, keep those. And then he whittles it, whittles it down and it even came to a point where he said, okay, here's the plan. You're not even going to fight. What? Hold on. You want us to win a battle by not even fighting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I want you to do is get jars, put put candles in them, and when I tell you, break the jars and blow a trumpet. That's the plan, God, seriously? But in desperate times, God seems to do different plans. And the reason I say all of this is because I wonder whether, with some of the children that are represented this morning, they're in desperate times. 
Maybe the plan in order to help them break out of this cycle of poverty is you. Who could you be the could you be the answer to someone else's prayer? You know, how many of us have prayers? I'm saying, God, I really need you to move on this. Really need you to move. But sometimes the best thing to do and the plan that God puts into motion is to say, can you be the answer to someone else's prayer as I'm looking for someone else to be the answer to your prayer? You know, desperate times, different plans. I see in Isaiah chapter 55 this, um, you know, God just says this, wait, that was too far. Um, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, and are, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Sometimes God planned, God's plans are a little bit different, but they are brilliant, and they are perfect. And so, very, very simply, you know, from this passage we can learn that in desperate times, there are different measures, and those different measures are that God wants to provide differently, different provision, different partnerships, and different plans. All to bring people to a place where they experience God's kingdom for themselves. And you can be a part of seeing that. I just want to play you this very quick video, and then I'll, I'll just come and we'll, we'll pray together. Some people have brought their child profiles. We're going to pray for each of the children that are represented here today. But I just wanted to show you a little video that gives you an example of what can happen, what can take place when into a child's life you bring different provision, different partnerships, different plans, and what God can do with that. Okay, here's a quick video to watch. <coughs> for three days without food. The friends that I played with in the neighborhood got captured and was being trained to become child soldiers. We would beg our parents just to buy one apple, but even the rotten ones we couldn't afford to buy. In a period of 18 months, I lost my small brother Patrick, my mom, and I lost my stepdad because of the terrifying disease of HIV AIDS. When my mother died, I was lost. I was looking for hope, for God to just show me that everything was going to be okay. Not knowing what tomorrow will look like, not knowing whether I would have a home, whether we would live to see the next day. I don't know why Aaron Mitchell decided to sponsor me, but when he did, my whole life changed. A group of people from Compassion showed up at my church. They said, you're gonna go to school, and then somebody's going to write to you. I don't have to worry about whether my parents would have enough money to keep me going to school. Even if I get sick, someone was there to take care of me. I felt safe. I felt wanted. My sponsor is Edwin Money, Maria and Hanshu. Aaron, me too. Five women from a little country that was sponsoring me. I am now a physical therapist and I'm working in a hospital. Clinical social worker. I was the first child in my family to go to high school, to go to college. I have a bachelor and a master in, in uh, biomedical engineering, a second master in engineering management, and uh, they call me into ministry, so I had to go and get a third master. I have a ministry called Youth Arise Africa that works with boys who don't have father figures. We open a small school. It's now providing the same opportunity that Compassion provided to me so that they too can break out of the cycle of poverty. <laughs> Whatever you do for the least of deeds, you do for me. You do for me. You do for me. I sponsor a child today to break the cycle of poverty in a child's life like my sponsor did for me. Hmm. The difference, and 
you are a part of that. For each of the children that you are supporting and those who already support here today, you're helping to change the narrative that they see all of a sudden hope, an opportunity for the future. Around the world, globally, as I mentioned, there's roughly an estimated 333 million children living in extreme poverty. I would love you today to not look at that number and choose to retreat from it, but instead choose to respond. And there's different ways in which you can do that. You know, as I mentioned today, I would love you to be that different partnership, that different provision, that different plan that gets put in place in order to be able to do a journey with a child to see them have a hope of a future. Maybe the, the response today is to pray. You know, we've got these little prayer cards and I'd love you to take one at home with you and you can scan a QR code and we'll send you different little prayer requests and stories of hope and things so that you can pray for the children that we're working with. But maybe for you, the response is not to retreat, but to respond and to actually say, okay, Diana, <coughs> Diana's 16. She probably had a sponsor at one point, but for whatever reason, the sponsor is now long, no longer to able to do the journey with Diana. So she's back here and we're, we're looking for someone to finish off the rest of journeying with Diana and her development. Maybe the response for you today is to say, okay, yeah, it might cause me to not have to have one takeaway a month or something like that. But for £32 a month, you can make a huge difference as we've just seen on that video. So uh, would you be, if you're willing and able, should we stand together? And if you have your picture of one of the children that you support, um, why don't you just hold that in your hand, okay? And we're going to pray together. So if you're willing and able, let's, let's stand. Lord, thank you so much for these amazing children. Thank you for Diana. Thank you for the children that are being held by sponsors around this room who have said, I'm going to journey with you. I'm going to be that different provision. I'm going to be that different plan. I'm going to help you to have the encouragement and the resources that, that you need in order to be able to have a, a hope <coughs> and a future, a different hope and a different future. Lord, thank you for everyone who's in this room, who's standing together. We're standing as a community, knowing that you are doing incredible things through the global church. Thank you for our brothers and sisters around the world who today are standing there in the gap, advocating on behalf of children and their local communities, wanting to see your kingdom established and transformation brought to the surrounding areas. Thank you for this local church. Thank you for the benefits together standing as beacons of lights in the communities that you've placed them. Thank you for every single person in this room who represents a different family, a different workplace, different college, different university, all the different places that you place us. Thank you that we can be the difference in those environments. So Lord, thank you for these incredible children. Thank you for this incredible um, family that's represented here. Lord, we humbly come to you and say, have your way. Help us to discern what part you want each of us individually to play in regards to seeing your kingdom established. In your name, amen. amen. amen.